Okay, so welcome back everybody. This is the 26th class in the Safer Call Touching a City Soul. This is what it looks like if anybody wants to uh, purchase it, if they haven't had, if they don't have it at home. But it's called Touching a City Soul. And we're on page 138. If people have the book, they can they can open up to it. I may still have a couple of copies if anybody um, needs it who's local. I know not everybody's local, but um, we can talk about it after class and see, you know, uh, or you can order it online. Um, so the, the book is a compilation, just to refresh our memories. It's a compilation of different talks that the previous Rebbe gave in Chicago, when he visited Chicago in 1942. Um, so the city's soul that he touched is Chicago. Uh, this came out um, in English a few years ago and we've been studying it for the last few months. Um, and going through the different, the different talks, different talks were to different groups of people <clears throat> and at different times of his visit, he was here for like a long weekend. So this particular talk that we're up to was said on Shabbos on the 13th of Shvat, which actually wound up being the day that his mother passed away in New York. He was here in Chicago. So um, he didn't find out until after Shabbos. His main, as we've been seeing from the different things that we've done so far, really a lot of what he's been talking about is strengthening Torah education in, in Chicago. I mean, that is something that, a theme that the previous Rebbe devoted really to his entire, and his entire life, uh, both in Russia and in, in America. Um, he risked his life in Russia for this and was imprisoned and really treated very badly um, because of his devotion to Jewish education. Um, as he said that, you know, if there's no, if there's no kid goat, there's no adult goat. So every, you know, we, we need to make sure that the next generation is educated in order to keep a Tyra, a Tyra community continuing. Um, so we've been reading a lot of his talks to the rabbis of the Talmud Torahs and to the children and to you know the different community members. Um, and he's also there's also been a couple of Hasidic discourses that talk about you know our service of Hashem and our davening and so on. So this is going to be uh, again it's going to be a talk. It's not a it's not a Hasidic discourse. And we talked about the difference when we get to the next discourse we can we, we can go over that again. But this is a talk so uh, on Shabbos. And the Shabbos that this talk happened, is, it was also a special Shabbos called Shabbos Shira, which we're gonna see as we, as we get into it. Um, there's a few Shabbos throughout the year that have special names. Uh, there's Shabbos Haggadol, the great Shabbos, which is the Shabbos before Pesach. There's Shabbos Shuva, which is the Shabbos between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur it's during the 10 days of Shuva. Um, and then there's this Shabbos here is called Shabbos Shira, it's the Shabbos that we read in the Torah portion of that week about the singing of Az Yashir, the song that the Jewish people sang um, when they crossed through the Red Sea as the Yamsuf as they left Egypt. Um, and it's called the, the, the Shabbos of song because of that song that was sung. And there's, special, there's a special custom that's connected with that Shabbos. And that's one of the things that the previous Shabbos is gonna talk about now and going to talk about the idea of Minhagim, I guess, and, and uh, mention that as well. Um, okay, so do you have the book? We're on page 138. <clears throat> so it says, the Maral of Prague was, was the outstanding Torah genius of his era. Um, the Maral of Prague is also known, his, his name was Rabbi Yehuda Loi, and he's also known probably most famously by children, <laughs> for having created the golem, right? Um, and a uh, very, very, very great Torah sage of his era. Still his Torah is learned today. He was also the ancestor of al Rebbe and his teachings, he has an explanation on Chomish, he has an explanation on Rashi called the Gor Aryeh, which really develops Rashi. Um, he, a mystical teacher, 
a great, a great sage, as well as a great leader and rabbi who really guided the Jewish people at that time um, and really protected them, well, with the Gailam and also with different prayers and so on, um, was the mystic, you know, very, out, and there's many, many stories about him, about the, his wisdom and, and also his, his, sort of his uh, divine providence, the, how he guided the people. So starts off by talking about the Maral. Prague, he was a towering scholar in both the revealed and hidden realms of the Torah, as well as in the philosophical discipline known as Chakira. Chakira is the Jewish uh, philosophy, I guess you could say, which is you know, very rigorous, uh, deep kinds of ideas. He was, talent, he was talented musically. He was adept in all fields of scholarship, both mystical and revealed. And he was a man of exemplary character. So we're talking about a great person, <laughs> very great person. Above all, he was a remarkable educator who hallowed and engraved customs in the heart of the Jews at large. So again, uh, note, noting that the previous Rebbe really is emphasizing a lot this idea of education. My great-grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek, so the previous Rebbe's great-grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek was the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, once recounted that as a little boy, he heard from his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, that when he was a little boy, his great-grandfather, the learned Ramosha Posner, told him that his father's great-grandfather, the Maral of Prague, established the following custom. So, it, so it's interesting, it's not, he's not just quoting the custom, right? He's saying where he got the source of the custom because he wants to show and sort of um, establish that this is something that was handed down throughout the generations in his family, that this was the custom of his great, great, great grandfather, basically. What is this custom? In the week preceding the Shabbos on which Parsha Spishalach was read, that's the, that's the parsha where the Jewish people leave Egypt and they sing Az Yashir. It's part of the daily davening. That's called the Song of the Sea that they sing as they went through the Red Sea. So on that Shabbos, he would instruct all the teachers and parents of little children to bring them to the courtyard of his shul on Shabbos Shira. As I said, that's, that Shabbos is called Shabbos Shira. There, after telling them that this was Shabbos Shira, the Maharal would direct the teachers to tell them all about the crossing of the sea, right? To, to describe how the Jewish people went through the Amsa, how the birds chirped and pranced as Moshe and all the men, women, men, all the people, men and women, sang the song that begins Az Yashir, and how the children fed the birds with fruit from the trees that miraculously grew in the sea. So there's a medrash that talks about when the Jewish people went through the sea, it wasn't just like the seabed split and they just walked through a dry seabed. They walk through and miraculously, even though the, wa the water is like congealed, but they were able to pull out like blocks of water that became drinking water, even though usually seawater is not necessarily drinking water and how there were trees with fruits and they could pick the fruits and, and eat from the fruits and how they fed the birds that came. So there was like a lot of miracles. The Mam Lois goes into a lot of detail with this if people are interested in that in, in more detail. There's lot, lots and lots of miracles that happened at the sea, during the crossing of the sea. And the Mara would encourage a description of that to the children on that Shabbos so that they could really sort of get into the spirit of this miracle. It was a huge, huge miracle. I mean, a whole nation went through the sea and you can imagine they're walking, you know, these little kids are hungry and they're fetchy. So like all these, you know, little snacks along the way and, and all these miracles. So, so the Mara wanted them to sort of envision that. To recall this, the children in the courtyard would then be given kasha, buckwheat, to scatter for the poultry and the birds. Finally, after blessing the children, the Mara would bless their parents that they should bring them up to the study of Torah, to the wedding canopy, and to the performance of good deeds. So this is a very visual, um, visual aid, I guess, in, in, in learning that is parsha that the Mara encouraged families to do. Another tradition, so this is Shabbos Shira that, that the, the, the priest is actually giving this talk. So he's recounting this custom that happened on Shabbos Shira, you know, beginning with the Mara. Another tradition relayed by my great-grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek, 
was that the Rama kissed the fingers of the Maharal. The Rama is Reb Moshe Isserlis, who was a commentator on the Shulchan Aruch, but that explains that in the footnote too. Um, so he lived in the same time period as the Maharal. He would kiss the fingers of the Maharal, the fingers which even in his youth wrote the holy works that roused thousands to do tshuva and that blazed a path for the study of Torah imbued with the awe of heaven and with divine service. So again, the Rama is a very well-known scholar. He's the foremost commentary uh, on, the, on the Shulchan Aruch and showing how much regard he held for the Maharal um, and, and emphasizing that the Maharal didn't, wasn't just a scholar, even though being a scholar is a very important thing. He, his scholarship, he devoted much of his life to rouse thousands to tshuva and to encourage people to serve Hashem through of heaven and divine service, not just, through, not just through learning. Meaning we have in general, right? We've talked about this many times in class that learning Torah is a very important mitzvah and learning Torah helps us see, shift our paradigm and look at the world through God's eyes and help and so on. And it needs to make an effect on our character and our behavior. It's not just an intellectual thing. We don't just study Torah to, uh, for an intellectual stimulation. We study Torah because it's, it, we're, we connect to God by doing that and we, and we try to bring those good character traits and those lessons into our characters, into our, into our day-to-day life, into a paradigm shift into the way we look at the world, the way we, we react to situations, the way we treat other people and so on. Like that, it's, it's, it needs to be something that we apply to our lives. So uh, many times in Torah, you'll see examples of great scholars. And in addition to talking about their scholarship, it talks about their righteousness and how they were role models and how they were leaders and how they helped the Jewish people in their generations and how they instructed them in fine character traits and, and in the service of Hashem, right? It's not just supposed to remain academic. Likewise, when the Mara was still a young man, the Maharshal, it's another great uh, halachist, said of him that such scholarly genius was not to be found throughout the world. So again, we had, there's many, many stories of the Mara and uh, here we're just building up that he was such a great scholar and such a great uh, um, Talmud Chacham. And what, what the previous I was emphasizing here is, and he would gather children to teach them to do something, a, a minhag of feeding the birds on, on, on Shabbat Shira so that they would be imbued and give a blessing to their parents that they should be raised with Yerushalayim. Um, so that the, it would become real to the children that this story of going through the of the going through the it would take time out of his day, right? In other words, if he's speaking to children, he's not learning Torah on the level that he can learn Torah. But it was that was important. My great grandfather, the Tzemaf Tzedek, once stated that the guidance with which the Maharal hallowed and engraved customs in the hearts of Jews at large is even loftier than all the classic works that he wrote. It's a very important sentence. <laughs> the, the guidance with which the Maral hallowed and, engra and engraved customs in the hearts of the Jews at large is even loftier than all of the classic works that he wrote, and he wrote prolifically. The Tzedek Tzedek added that the superiority of this heritage of customs over those classic works parallels the superiority of engraving over writing. For in the course of time, writing can fade but engraving is, is, is eternal. So we know this idea about writing and engraving in Hasidus from another story that actually happened in Chicago too, came out, I think we spoke about it in the very beginning of this book about, about um, how uh, Rabbi Yosef Weinberg came to Chicago to raise money from I think a Jack Lunzer at the time. And, um, and he spoke to him in his office about this idea um, about a Jew is always a Jew and you know, maybe because he was raising money for the yeshiva and raising money from people who weren't necessarily keeping to our mitzvahs for, for the yeshiva. And he was encouraging them that, you know, it's um, even if the letters become a little faded, but a Jew is always a Jew, it always connected to Torah. When he came back and he told the Rebbe, the Rebbe told him, really, it's like a Jew, the Jew is connected to Torah, like engraved letters, not like written letters, that um, engraved letters can fade and they have to be, when you write, and when you write something on a piece of paper, um, sorry, not engraved letters can fade. Written letters can fade. When you write something on a piece of paper, that ink can fade, and the ink and the paper are two separate things. 
and they can't, they were once separate and then they get together and then they could become detached again. But when, when something is engraved, like engraved in stone, um, it, it, the letters and the item itself are one. It's the same thing. It can't become faded. It can be filled with a little dust and dirt and you have to maybe blow off the dust and dirt, but the letters on the stone are, are always one and they can't become faded. It's one thing. It's not two separate things. And that's how a Jew is with Tyra. Every Jew, every neshama is one with the Tyra. Maybe there's a little dust and dirt that got in the way that has to be cleaned off. So here, that's it. that muscle is being... Um, used here to explain even the difference like at a, on a deeper level, taking that muscle to a deeper level that, that um, the idea of engraving customs in a Jew's soul and in, in these children, right? That that takes importance, this engraving as, as like as important as the difference between engraving and writing, that, that, the, that the customs stay united when we educate children with the customs and and the and the dearness of Torah and its and its customs then it stays one with the neshama even more than what they learn right that maybe what the learning they also has to stay with them but the customs is going to stay with them sort of on a deeper level i mean this is a this is a concept a concept of the importance of, importance of customs is a concept that is very very strong in chabad um, about how how, um, how, of course, Taira Mitzvah is learning Taira doing mitzvahs is 100% essential. The Abishers, the Abishers commands and, 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 we, and we do them. Um, and that's really what Hashem wants us to do. And then we have, and, that, and those are obvious. And then we have the things that the Rabbanim have added as safeguards or, you know, the, the seven mitzvahs the Rabbanim, those are things that are hinted at and implied in the Taira. And the minhagim um, are, are described as something that causes joy to Hashem. So they can add, when we're talking about every time we do a mitzvah, every time we learn Torah, we're, we're trying to build our relationship with Hashem. So the minhagim that we do are like the extra things that bring joy to Hashem in the relationships. Like when we're in a relationship with a person, there's things we have to do. And there's things that maybe they imply that they imply that we understand they want. And then there's extra things that we just, what we just do that just makes them happy that they didn't even ask for, you know? So the minhagam are sort of like in that category. And in many things in Hayom Yom, right? The Hayom is that, the, that book that the Rebbe put together, mainly of the previous Rebbe's teachings, um, each day of the year, each Hebrew date of the year has another little short thought. And that thought uh, has to do with, you know, some idea that sometimes you can see an obvious connection to that date or that parsha, and sometimes it looks like it's just the idea that's connected. Um, and many times in Hayom, it talks about the importance of minhagim. For example, on Rosh Hashanah, the whole Hayom Yom is all about customs. You would think on Rosh Hashanah, it would be talking about the laws of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a pretty main day in the Jewish calendar. It's like we're reinstating our service of Hashem, we're reincarnating God as our king. And that Hayom Yom has talked a lot about Minhagim, because again, the richness of the relationship is in those areas of the gift that we're giving Hashem in our relationship. Um, and we know like, like for Chabad actually has a different, a different um, order for the four questions on Pesach. We start, we start with the one that, that's a, that, that's a Minhag. So the minhagim are very, in, specifically in Chabad, but in Torah in general, minhagim are very important because they add that that flavor, that beauty, that depth, that that um, that extraness, so to speak, in 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 the relationship. So here, the re the previous Reb is talking about this minhag that the that the maharal uh, is having all the children do on Shabbat Shira, but he wants them to have that richness. Why is the Rebbe speaking? Why is the previous Rebbe speaking about it in his visit to Chicago? Right, we've already spoken. Of, he's already spoken about the importance of Torah learning and making sure that it's all kosher Torah learning. Um, we don't know. I mean, I can't tell you why the previous Rebbe did something, but um, but he, but we could think that his whole um, this whole like thrust of education he's getting to now this idea of the importance of a min hug so um okay so I don't know, any any questions before we go into the next section i see if somebody put in a chat this is what min hug is throughout tyra he 
means. Um, yeah, it, yeah, in part, yes. Yeah. So there's a quote that says, um, the minhag of Yisrael, the custom of Yisrael is the same as Torah. There's a, like a quote. So yes, that is, that is, yes, that, that, in, um, that sort of emphasizes the importance of minhag across the board, 100%, right? For all Jews, all the minhag of Yisrael. And there's many different minhagim of Yisrael. Like, for example, it's not one of the 613 mitzvahs that a man wears a yarmulke, right? But it's a minhag Yisrael tairahi. Um, and there's many things in that category. And then in addition, this kind of minhag that the previous I was talking about is, is, I don't know if it's a minhag Yisrael. I don't know if you could say it's a minhag Yisrael that to have kasha, you know, to, it's a Chabad minhag that's based on the Maharal. Well, maybe there's other chassidim who do it too. I'm not, I don't know because the Maharal wasn't a Chabad chassid, he predated the Alter Rebbe, right? He was his ancestor. Um, so yes, there's general minhagim, th thank you for bringing that up. And then there's also specific minhagim to different Hasidic groups and different you know, kinds of things. And the Rebbe, whenever somebody sort of became more connected to Chabad and they had specific minhagim, let's say different kinds of Hasidim and they wore different kinds of Shtraimlach or Spadiks or things like that, the Rebbe would always encourage them to keep that lavush, you know, to keep the to keep that that um, that type of uh, clothing that they would have from their ancestors. Anyway, are there any other questions before we go on to the next section? It's like the end of like one section. Does that mean the minhagim cause an engraving on our soul, a stronger connection? Yeah, I guess you could put it that way. Good, good, good idea. The, also, I think I think the minhagim are very important because. And they're very deep inside people because it relates back to their childhood. Um, there, there's certain there's certain beautiful things um, that that my family would do, um, even though we weren't that observant. But when the big holidays came, there were certain things as nothing to do. Just like my grandmother's my grandmother's wooden filter fish bowl that was that I can't use anymore. You know that kind of thing. It's it's um, and I think the minhagim. I think. It, it enriches everyone and enriches the experience as a child even. And that, and that carries people through, I think, to adulthood and then wants to, to uh, give that to their children, to their children also, leave it to their children. Yeah. When the, um, when the Mankaka, and I don't know how to pronounce it, were created, was there, was it created kind of for, because of the needs of the community at that time? You're talking about Minhag, when the Minhagan? Yeah, yeah um, you know, you know, this, this one in particular is, uh, you know, with having to do with children to engrave something at that time. So they were worried about, you know, was it because there was a need in a community to, to do that in particular? when it first that's got started. That's a good started. question. You're right, that's a good question. I don't know if I can answer that authoritatively, but one could assume a minhag that started by like a tzaddik who's the leader of the generation, one could assume that that's the call of the hour, you know? And then mm -hmm. we keep it going. There are minhagim that were started, you know, thousands of years ago. Those are minhagim for all of the Israel for all time, like the wearing of the yamaka, for example. But there are- so, because he, he's, uh, the previous rabbi is talking about it now when there definitely is a, was a need at that time to right. pull and, people and, back. And even the Maharal, I mean, the Maharal lived, you know, in the 1500s. It was, it was right. a need then. It was a need <laughs> and then. And it's certainly a need now as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay, so then let's continue um, on in the, so we're on page 139 on the middle. Or, okay, so let us now understand what Shabbat signifies in the light of Hasidus. So it's gonna get a little more esoteric now. The Torah, when he's talking on Shabbat So first he talks about the minhag of Shabbat Shira, and now he's gonna talk a little bit more about the depths of Shabbat Shira. The Torah and its mitzvahs are eternal, unchanged by time or space. Today is Shabbos Shira. And on Shabbos Shira, Jewish souls sing the song that begins Az Yashir together with Maishra Rabbeinu, 
Just as we all sang it for the first time after the splitting of the Sea of Reeds, when God took us out of the Egyptian exile. Isn't that beautiful? I'm just saying. Like, I feel like everybody should, you know, one of our refrigerator things, like write that down, put it in our refrigerators on Shabbat Shira. Like, guess what guys? This Shabbos, we're all singing Az Yashir with Maisha Rabbeinu every year on Shabbos Shira. All the Jewish souls are singing Az Yashir with Maisha Rabbeinu the same way we did that first, that first year. In the morning prayers, we praise Hashem. So this is part of, I mean, Az Yashir is part of our morning prayers too, but this is a bracha that's part of morning prayers. Who in his goodness renews every day continuously the work of creation. Every Jew knows what those words mean, that God in his kindness continuously renews the life of all the worlds and of all created entities every day. Each time, moreover, this takes place just as it took place at, at the initial creation. At that time, during the six days of creation, he made that which does not exist, exist. The creator created the world and all its created entities from nothing to something. And every day there's a diffusion of light from the revelation that appeared on the corresponding day of the six days of creation. So this is a very basic concept in Chassidus that the world wasn't create, you know, we just read Parshas Bracious a few weeks ago. World wasn't, or a week ago. Um, the world wasn't created once, you know, 5,782 years ago, and then it's just sort of been trucking along ever since then, right? Um, that was the beginning of creation, it was the first creation of the world, so to speak, but the world is being recreated constantly. Like we say in the bracha, he renews every day continuously the work of creation. Because physical creation is not a, nat so to speak, natural um, existence, it requires godly energy at every moment to keep recreating it. It doesn't have an existence on its own. It only has an existence because God creates it and he has to constantly create it. It's like it, there needs to be constant energy put forth to, to make the world exist. It's like the, you know, like the story of the people who are sitting around and talking about how, if God wanted to destroy the world again, what, you know, what would he do? We just for Parshas Nayach, right? Uh, says, oh, he'd bring a flood or he'd bring a fire. It's like, no, all he would have to do is stop creating. It doesn't have to destroy it. He could just stop creating. It would revert back to nothingness, right? Hashem is constantly creating the world. So the fact we, um, we talk about the, so to speak, the beginning of creation, right? Because before there was a physical world, there was just God. And then God decided to create a physical world. And ever since then, every day, Baruch Hashem has decided to keep creating the physical world. And it, it helps us, I mean, just even on a sort of emotional level, it helps us to understand that anything that's happening now is something that God is choosing to recreate. So there must be a purpose for it, a reason for it. It's for our benefit in some way. It's something that we, there's nothing that can't be um, coexisting with God's and God's essence and God's request of us of keeping time with us or whatever it is, because he's constantly creating, which means it's part of God's plan, whatever it is that he's creating. So he's saying that this is, what is Shabbashira? Shabbashira, every Shabbashira we sing as Yashir. So like this is Shabbashira that the previous Rebbe is speaking. So everyone is singing as Yashir. And to keep in mind that every day, every moment, really. It's not only every day, but every moment, God is constantly recreating the world. And really the parable for that, like the muscle in creation that helps us understand that as just even for ourselves, right? We breathe in and we breathe out every moment. We, we need to take a breath to recreate ourselves, right? Our heart is beating and then it stops beating. That's also a parable that helps us to understand the constant pulse of creation, like Hashem is constantly pulsing the world into creation, pulsing the world into creation, pulsing the world. So this is the way our heart is constantly beating us into existence. And you know, it's not at the same level, but like up, it's a parable to help us to help us understand that. Um, so that is true of, of all of creation for all time. Um, it is written in the beginning, voracious. So what is the purpose of this creation that Hashem is constantly recreating? Like, what is its goal? 
Hashem is creating and he must, he has a goal. So it's written in the beginning, Bereshis, that's the first word of the Chumash is Bereshis. God created heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The world was created, explains the Medrash, for the sake of Torah, which is referred to as Reshis Darkai, the beginning of his path, and for the sake of the Jewish people, the children of Israel, who are similarly referred to as Reshis Tvuasai, the beginning of his harvest. So again, the word, we're saying the word that the Torah begins with is Bereshis, which means in the beginning. But it can also be, that word can also be divided up to be days, racious, to first. And there's two things that are called firsts. First, one thing that's called first is Tyra. There's a, how do we know that it's called that? Because there's a puzzle that says Tyra is called racious Darko, the beginning of his path, of God's path. So Tyra is called racious. And another thing is called first, which is B'nai Israel because we are called Reish's Tvuasai, the beginning of his harvest, of Hashem's harvest. So we can divide up that word, Reish's, which means in the beginning, we usually translate it as beginning, we can divide it up and translate it as two firsts. What are the two firsts? Torah and the Jewish people. So why did God create the world? Because of Torah and the Jewish people. So it says this twofold purpose of creation is hinted at by the word for in the beginning, Reish's which is composed of the letter Bayes, two, and the word racious, beginning. So again, he's saying, this is Shabbos Shira on Shabbos Shira. We all are singing this song of praise to Hashem again, like we did originally. And in fact, the whole world is constantly being recreated. And what's the purpose of this creation? The purpose of creation is that the Yidin should keep Torah mitzvahs in the physical world. That's the purpose of creation. In order for Torah to be done by Yidin, there needed to be a physical world. Otherwise, just, it's, just become, it's just theoretical learning something in a theoretical way. We didn't need a physical world if everybody was just going to sit and learn Torah. We could be doing that as souls in heaven. We didn't need to have actual physicality. So the purpose of creation is Torah should be kept by the Jews in a physical world, right? That's, that's the purpose of creation. Um, this is why the five books of the Chumash are divided into readings for the weeks of the year. For thus, the concepts of each reading diffuses its distinctive light into its particular week. So we don't only really have Hashem recreating the world at every moment through Torah and, and recreating the Jews and recreating the physical world, but the way that we sort of get that creative energy, I guess you could say, um, is that the Torah is divided into a reading, we call it a sedra, right? Um, for every week, we, the parsha of the week. And that parsha is the light and direction for that week, right? So in Hayyamah, we talked about earlier, talks about how um, we're supposed to live with the times. And living with the times means living with the parsha of the week, that each parsha of the week has a certain energy and a certain lesson in our service of Hashem that we are to bring into that week with us, basically, which is one of the reasons why we have the custom of learning the parsha of the week with Rashi every week, why we learn parsha every week, like we, you know, we're supposed to live with that week's parsha, which is why when it was raining during the week of the flood, it made perfect sense. <laughs> um, e examples are preserved in the notes in which I recorded my father's words on various occasion. This is a jolly week, or this is a stern week. Actually, this is a jolly week is this week. The, the previous, that's also in Hayom Yom. This week is Parsha Lech Lecha. And in Hayom Yom, it says, this is a happy week. Why is it a happy week? Because this Parsha, we live with Avram Avinu in every section of the parsha, right? The parsha is divided into seven, and we learn in one section each day of the week. And in this week's part, last week, um, Avram was born, but it was only born in the last few sukkim of the parsha. The rest of the parsha had a lot of unfortunate circumstances going on, right? This week, we every single section of the parsha has to do with Avram Avinu and his life. So uh, it's called a happy week because we get to spend the week with Avram Avinu. Um, this week is a time for us to receive mazel tov blessings for the exodus from Egypt, right? Talk about Parshas B'Shalaf, right? Like that's the, that's, the, that's the message of that week. Or for the splitting of the Sea of the Reeds, 
or for the giving of the Torah, or for the commandment to build God a sanctuary, or for the erection of the sanctuary, and so on and on. Meaning each week has something that we, like that's the theme of the week, and that's what's happening this week, and we, we, could, be ha- you know, we could be happy about that theme of, of the week. Each week's reading reveals the content of that week, and that revelation is felt in all five levels of the soul. So it talks about um, five levels of the soul, and in the footnote, it actually lists them for you. We've talked about it in classes before, right? The nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. So how do we get at these five levels of the soul? Like, where, do, where does this come from, right? Everything in Chassidus Kabbalah is based somewhere in Tersha Bechsav. So there's actually five different psukim in the, in the Tanakh that refer to a soul, and there's five different words that are used in these different psukim and different at times in Tanakh that to refer to a soul. So according to the simple explanation of, of written Torah, it's just five different words and they're all referring to the soul. Hasidus takes it a step deeper as it is wants to do in general and says actually these five different terms that the souls refer to refer to five different levels of the soul. It's not just, oh, five different words and they're all synonyms. No, they each refer they have a specific level of the soul that they are connected with. And, they, and, and we have five levels of the soul. Um, and each of these levels, they can be broken up and, de- and, de- and de- uh, described or defined in slightly different ways. But generally speaking, they fall, usually we say they fall into two categories, which are called Naram Chai, the three lower levels and the two higher levels. Sometimes the four lower levels are one and the fifth level is a second one. Um, but the three lower levels are sort of what's called permeating soul levels that, that permeate into the person. So the nefesh, which is the lowest, is more like the sort of like the life force, the pulsing of the life force, the, the um, being alive, basically the soul and the body, the part of the soul that keeps the body alive and the, and the ruach, which is the next level is like the emotional um, and, uh, and the neshama is like the intellectual aspect. So those are all, in a way, they're internalized in the person's body, right? Their, their blood, their circulatory system that, they're, that keeps them alive, their emotions, their intellect, their understanding. Those are like the lower levels of the soul. And then the chai, which are the higher two levels of chaya and yechida, the chai is more the sort of the transcendental level of the soul the uh, super consciousness, um, it's called a surrounding soul power. It's, it's sort of larger than can fit into the body, quote, quote unquote. I'm using terms that, you know, this doesn't, the soul doesn't have physical uh, qualities, but just to help us understand. Um, and that's like the sort of like the Ratzayin level of the soul, the, 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 the part that cleaves to Hashem that wants to be, um, that has a desire to be one with Hashem. And then the Yechid the highest level of the soul, which is that point, it's usually sometimes called the Pintle Yid, the point of the soul, which is actually one with God at all times. And it can, you know, nothing can sever it from its connection to Hashem. Um, and that's like the essence of the soul. So these five levels are actually five different levels of the soul. So each week's reading reveals the content of that week. And that revelation is felt in all five levels of the soul. In other words, maybe we, we can feel some of it some of the time, but actually our soul is feeling something on all five levels of that week's Torah portion every week. This is a little plug to coming to partial class on Thursday mornings, just saying, right? Encouraging other women to come to partial class because then we can feel it a little bit on our intellectual level too, and maybe on our emotional level more, you know, we can actually bring it in because we're like learning about the parsha. So just say, well, commercial break here. Um, so my notes also record a talk in which my father said, whenever a Jew is called up to the reading of the Torah, literally whenever he has an aliyah, an ascent to the Torah, right? That's the bracha that a, per, a person um, makes as what we, it's called an aliyah, right? They're called up to the Torah, they make a bracha on the Torah. This ascent is experienced by all the components of his soul. It's called an aliyah, which means an elevation because his soul is getting an elevation when he's called up to the Torah. 
His nefesh ascends to the Torah in the spiritual world of Asiya. His ruach ascends to the Torah in the world of Yitzira. His neshama ascends to the Torah in the world of Bria. The transcendental soul level called Chaya ascends to the Torah in the world of Atzilos. And the transcendental soul level called Yechida ascends to the Torah as far as the sphere of Malchus of Ainsof, which transcends the world of Atzilos. So we need a little translation here. Um, so not only does the soul have these five levels, but um, this, these five levels are also sort of built into the fabric of creation. Um, really, in this context, the, it's four and one as opposed to five, right? It's, it talks about Sefer Hayatsira, the book of, of formation of, of creation, which is attributed to Avram Avinu. It talks about the different systems, the Kabbalistic systems that are put into the world, into the structure of creation. So there's the system of four, which, re, which is connected to the name of Yudke Vavke, the name of God that he used to create the world. And there's the system of 22, which is the 22 letters of the Alphas. And there's the system of 10, which is the system of 10 of the 10 spheroids. But the system of four actually has a fifth dimension to it because the, the system of four, which is Yud and He and Vav and He, which is like the four letters of Hashem's name, which, res, which each of those letters are connected to the 10 spheres, they're connected to the four levels of the soul. But the beginning of the Yud, of Yud and He and Vav and He, is, has caused what's a Kaitse Shel Yud, or the thorn of the Yud which is the fifth level, which is that point. It's a little tiny point and it's the point of the soul, it's the Yechida. It's also in the world, in the creation, what's called the Seder Hishtashos, in the order of creation, there's, um, there's what's called four worlds. There's God in his essence and then there's four worlds. And then after that, there's like a physical, the physical world. So the four worlds, which we've also, had you know come across in class before Atsilas, Bria, Yetzir, and Asiya, um, which are which are four levels going from let's say Hashem and his essence to the physical world. It's not it is a gradation, um, the highest level being closest to God and the lowest level being closest to the physical world, but it's not like physical places but it's levels of revelation and concealment of godliness, right? The higher the world is closest to godliness, so the more revealed godliness is and the less self-awareness any being has. Um, and it switches, it flips as it goes down. These four worlds, um, okay, we can have a whole class on them by itself We at a different time, but there's that fifth level is the level above the four worlds, which is like Hashem's essence. Here, what the point that the previous Rebbe is saying is that the five levels of the soul are also connected to these four worlds and that fifth level, which is Hashem, or in this context, he says, the sphere of Malchus of Ein Sof, which transcends the world of Atzilus, which means we're not talking exactly of Hashem's essence, we're talking about the next level up the, after the four worlds, going towards Hashem's essence, um, which is higher than the world of Atzilos. So the five levels of the soul are connected to these five levels of creation. And when a person, um, the sedra, the parsha of the week, has an impact on all five levels of the soul. And when a person gets an aliyah to the Torah, all five levels of the soul are affected. And they are connecting to all the five levels of creation. It, basically, that's the summary of what we said. Should I say that again? So basically what we're saying, the point is that the parasha of the week has a message for us, a godly message for us for that week. The, there's a revelation of godliness that is housed in that week's parsha that that is that we connect to for that week whether we know or not our soul is connecting to it it's good if we could know it a little bit too meaning if we learn the parsha then we know it a little bit it also helps us to internalize it but our soul is being affected by that week's parsha with or without our knowledge because this is the energy the creative energy in the world so our soul is connecting to it so 
Um, and our soul is connecting to it on all five levels of the soul. Um, those five levels of the soul also connect to these five levels of creation. So for the example that the previous step is explaining here is that when a person gets an aliyah to the Torah, which an aliyah means an elevation. So what happens is their soul, all their five levels of the soul are having an aliyah. Each level of the soul is having an elevation to one of the five levels of creation. That's like, I guess it gets to, it gets to connect with when it has an aliyah to the Torah. And maybe I'll reread, now that we like sort of discussed it, I'm gonna just reread that paragraph and hopefully it'll be a little more uh, clear. So, um, so in the beginning, he was like, this is why the five books of the Chumash are divided into readings, right? Each of those readings has an effect on us and there's a theme for the week, a jolly week, a stern week, right? We, that is the truth in the world and that and our soul feels it on a soul level. Each week's reading reveals the content of that week and that revelation is felt in all five levels of the soul. It's felt in all five levels of the soul, no, whether or not we're aware of it, meaning our soul is feeling this because this is the godly energy of the week. That week's parish is the godly energy of the week and our soul is feeling it. The question is, is our body feeling it? You know, how, how, can, how can we get our soul and our body to talk to each other and how can we get our, how can we hear it? So this is an aside, but again, like the way, the the best way for us usually to hear these things is to learn about it, right? Like when we learn about it, then we can we can try to assimilate it into our into our uh, experience. So our the the contents of the week that revelation is felt on all five soul levels. My that my notes also record a talk in which my father said. So he's quoting his father the Rebbe Rashab. Whenever a Jew is called up to the reading of the Torah, literally whenever he has an aliyah, an ascent to the Torah, this ascent is experienced by all the components of his soul. His nefesh ascent, that's the lowest level of the soul, ascends to the Torah in the spiritual world of Asiya. That's the lowest world. His ruach ascends, his ruach is the next level of the soul, ascends to the world, to the Torah in the world of Yetzirah. That's the next world up also. His neshama, that's the next level of the soul up, ascends to the Torah in the world of Bria. That's also the next world up. The transcendental soul level called Chaya, that's the fourth level of the soul, ascends to the Torah in the world of Atzilas, the fourth world. And the transcendental soul level called Yechida, that's that pintle yid, that essence of the soul, ascends to the Torah as far as the sphere of Malchus of the Ein Sof, which is above all four worlds, which transcends the world of Atilas. It transcends the, the world the, the world of Atilas. How, how how is that? Are we doing okay? <laughs> Surprising that it's just a sicha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exact yeah, I hear what you're saying, but it is. <laughs> wait, wait. If you look back early in the book to the Maimarum, <laughs> you'll see that the Maimarum are do even more than that. yeah do the people um who don't get an aliyah like at the, you know there's only a certain number of people that go up and get an aliyah somehow does it happen for them too if they're listening if it, you know what i mean like yeah yeah so is it contagious yeah. kind of is it contagious <laughs> in um, a good well, way it, right it's a, right it's well Yes and no, meaning there's something that's happening for there's something that's happening for for all Jews all over the world whenever any Jew gets any kind of you know connection to Hashem. Where you know we're all you know the parables of a boat, right? So like the, we're all in this together. So what is it? A rising tide lifts all whatever something. Yes. So like the whole the the whole everything gets lifted whenever any one person gets lifted. So any Jew who gets lifted is also schlepping the rest of the Jewish nation and the world with them as they're getting, you know, as they're getting their aliyah. So to some extent, yes. Um, obviously, it's not exactly the same, which is why, for example, there's a custom to get an aliyah of the shops before a person's birthday or like there's certain times that uh, people get an aliyah because th that's a specific thing or if they have a yard site or, you know, there's different things that why a person would 
would want to specifically get an aliyah that Shabbos. But yes, everybody who's there and everybody who's, even people who are not there, whenever a Jew does a mitzvah, every other Jew benefits. So there is definitely a benefit. And, you know, more godliness is brought into the world, we all benefit, right? So a person likes a light, you know, you know, you walk into a room, you turn on the light, and there's somebody else in the room, they're also benefiting from the light. You turned on the light, but they also get some benefit from it. So there is a benefit. I don't know if it's exactly the same benefit as the person who's getting the aliyah, but yeah, there's a benefit. There's a benefit. Uh, are we okay? Any other questions? Is there a benefit to being shul and hear the parsha? Well, for men, it's a mitzvah. I mean, a mitzvah. I don't know if it's actually one of the targets, but it's definitely a halacha that men are supposed to hear the parsha being read and shul, possible. You know, with a minion. Uh, women don't have that same obligation. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, so if men, how do we work those five sephiros in a similar way if we might, you know, if women aren't obligated to get it that way? So that, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, right, so an aliyah for, I was waiting for somebody to say, what about women? <laughs> um, so here's the, here's the scoop. Um, it actually said, there's actually so, somewhere else, I can't remember now where I just read it, but I just read it recently that, you know, like, this, what, so this is what happened. The men get an aliyah when they get an aliyah to the Torah, because that's what Hashem says happens to them when they get an aliyah to the Torah. But women don't have that obligation, and so they—that's not how they get their aliyah, right? It's not doesn't. It's like it's, that, it's not the same thing. It does. It's not just a random thing. It, this is what this is what men need. Um, so, in general, I mean, I I don't know like the specific exact same. I mean, I could see if I can you know find a, a exact same this five things you know etc 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 however we know that in general so it gets us saying what about chitas right so we're, we're it, the connection to the parsha is definitely through learning the parsha for for everybody right um but in general the concept of the 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 different levels of the soul being like ignited there are different ways that there's different parts of Jewish practice, I guess you could say, Torah practice that ignites or or um, elevates the different levels of the soul, right? So like there's physical mitzvahs, there's emotional mitzvahs, there's intellectual mitzvahs, there's the level of what's called um, giving over our, our ratzayin to Hashem, giving over our desire to Hashem, there's Mesir Snefesh. These five like practices each relate to a different level of the soul. So we can we can ignite and use and utilize each of our levels of the soul and our service of Hashem. Men and women have to do that. Um, but each of the levels of the soul, so like the ident our identity, you know, like when we when we reaffirm our identity and we and we base our actions on our essence that ignites our yichida, our the, the the highest level of the soul once that is ignited it also that also diffuses into the four lower levels so you can work it from the bottom up or from the top down but it can light up each of the levels of the neshama so each time we do something we make a choice like that 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 ignites our neshama each of the levels of our neshama. And is that contagious to those around us? <laughs> well, anything we do, meaning anything that we do is something that, again, helps everybody else. Right, so uh, Maureen is saying the mitzvahs of the women, right, there's, there's mitzvahs of the women that relate to the women, there's mitzvahs of the men that relate to the men. We, exactly, that's, that's, another, that's another point well taken, right? Each, each of each of whatever each per, it's like um, it's like the path to Hashem can only be directed by Hashem, right? Because He could tell us how we can get to Him. 
So, right, there are special mitzvahs for men and there are special mitzvahs for women. I don't know to answer the five levels exactly which one connects to which, how, to each of the other, each mitzvah. But this idea of the five levels of, you know, it talks about the nigun relates to different levels of the neshama, stories relate to different levels of the neshama, learning relates to different levels of the neshama. In other words, anytime we do any, all of these kinds of things, we are igniting each of the levels of our neshama. And when we make a decision to do something that it maybe is not the easiest thing for us to do, but we're doing it because Hashem wants us to, and we're asking ourselves, what would Hashem want from me in this situation? So that's also igniting a level of the neshama. In other words, these are specific practices that ignite specific levels of the neshama. It's also true, as Gitzel said, Learning the parsha of the week connects us to that level of, you know, connects us to that energy of the week. As Maureen said, you know, the missus of the women, that's how, that's our, that's our direction to Hashem. You know, all of these things, I mean, everybody, every path is a path, right? Hashem is infinite and the missus are eternal. So each mitzvah has an eternal path to Hashem. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it feels like this is, um, it is 1030 now. Um, so this is, a, I guess, a good spot to, it's the end of the thought anyway. Um, I guess we'll, we'll need to end here. Um, I wish everybody a good week. I want to remind everybody that, um, well, there's a partial class on Thursday. You can tell a few people about it, encourage other people to come. And also Sunday night, this coming Sunday night is our annual Ethel Maller Memorial Lecture. Um, you should have gotten emails about it to sign up. It, you can sign up on, on basementalchemchicago.org. If you didn't get an email, you can go to basementalchemchicago.org, women's programs, you know, the Ethel Maller Lecture. So that you sign up and you get a... Um, a Zoom link is also a little snack treat bag that can be delivered, you know, to local areas or if people want, they can come pick it up on my back porch on Sunday. Again, it's going to be on Zoom this year for the second year. Hopefully it'll be in person. Um, I think it's called for 745 and then begins at eight or maybe it's called for eight. Uh, I myself, I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> at this, at this sec oh, I should stop this recording.